say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need another chance to be who you are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo. I see you every week. Holy cow, do I have a great show, and I'm not making this one up. I, well, I don't make any of them up. I mean, that's kind of what I do here. You know, I, I do this show, right, and, and, I, and, I, and I get these amazing guests who write these amazing books, and, you know, they're from all over the world, right? It just happens to be that my guest happens to be just down the road from me a little bit, and he has written a number one bestseller on Amazon. It is called Actualized Leadership. For those of you who are watching live or... And I know you CastBox FM live folks who are joining me live right now. I know you can't see the book, but it's called Actualized Leadership, Meeting Your Shadow and Maximizing Your Potential. His name is Dr. William L. Sparks. Oh, man. If I, I Listen, I know that when you hear a leadership book, first thing that we do is our eyes open up a little bit wider and our ears perk up and go, oh, leadership. I like leadership, right? And then I'm going to tell you, then, then what happens is you kind of go, oh, yeah, leadership book. Well, you know, I've, you know, there's so many leadership books, right? This one, Actualized Leadership, is like none other. I am telling you right now, I have read this thing. I have read it on my Kindle. I have read it on the, on the paperback that I'm holding up here. I have read it. It is absolutely amazing. It is life-changing. This is more than a leadership book. This is about you. This is about you changing you. This is about, well, he'll get into it, but listen, do you remember Star Wars? Okay. Remember Star Wars? You know, we had this dark side, right? Remember that? The dark side, right? And we had that, you know, right? Darth Vader and that whole thing, right? And the old Star Wars, right? And right, and, and then, you know, we, you know, we had the, you know, the, the, the good people on the other side with Luke, right? And we find out that he's father and everything. And really, it's kind of all jumbled up there and everything. We're going to deal with the dark side of leadership, right? We're actually going to deal with the dark side of you. And and he's gonna and and Dr. Sparks is gonna call it shadow. Oh, I, I mean, I, but you know what? Let's not get all into that because he's gonna want to talk about that. And and we're gonna deal with the dark side. And it's gonna be fun. And it's gonna be awesome. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't care if you are nine listening to my show or 90, you're gonna grow from this book, okay? Because that's what this book it does is it's gonna help you grow and become the person that you always dreamed that you could be, the person that you've been intended to become. That's what this book is gonna help you do. And he is absolutely fabulous. He has a great sense of humor and he's also he's also an unbelievable psychologist and it's going to be awesome so, but let's do what we do every week right let's check in right I, I believe that we are four part people we are physical people mental people emotional people and spiritual people and i believe that all those things have to kind of work together right to make us the whole person because that's just kind of that's because that's what we are right so let's let's talk about where you're at out there today on a scale of one to ten one being miserable ten being outstanding five being average all right how are you doing physically Give yourself a number. What do you think you are out there physically? Are you, are you feeling like, eh, I'm just kind of average, you know, or are you feeling a little under the weather? Maybe you're feeling like a three or two. Or maybe, maybe you're going, you know what, Jay, I, I, I feel okay, but I'm, I'm a little short here because I should have worked out and I didn't, or, you know, I haven't exactly been eating right, right? So whatever that number is, what is that number for you? And then the question becomes, well, what can you do to change it right now? What is something that you can do right now? What is, what is it that you could do right now to change that number? Right? I mean, there, there's always things that we can do. You know, it can be taking a walk. Matter of fact, you can be listening to this show, taking a walk. Maybe you are. People who listen, you know, in 35 countries around the world are listening to the show. And it's like, well, maybe you're out there walking around. Maybe you're you're listening to me on the beach somewhere. Great. Awesome. Right? Getting a little exercise. Good for you. So you got that number somewhere between 1 and one, 1 and 10. Right? You got that number. And then how do you get to the next number? Whatever that number is. All right? Good for you. All right, let's look at the second area. We're talking about the mental area. What do I mean by the mental area? Well, we have two halves of the brain, right? We have this right side, which is our creative, fun side, right? We like music, right? And that type of thing. That's kind of that right side. And then we have that Mr. Spock logical side, right? On the left side of the brain, right? And, and we really need to feed both halves of that brain, right? We, we, we really, really do if we want to be a really whole mental person. So what are you consuming? What are the things that you're consuming to help grow both sides of their brain? Right, and there's a lot of ways to do that. You can listen to shows like this. You can read. You can take up a musical instrument. You can do all sorts of things. You can learn a new language. You can all sorts of things that you can do to help yourself grow. But the but the real big deal for me is this: that you're growing, okay, and that you're consuming good things, right? Not bad things, good things. So on a scale of one to ten, one miserable, ten outstanding. Where are you at this week, right? You feeling like you're mentally, you know, Jay, I've I've, I've been reading the books that you've been telling me to read, and actually I've been gr- good. 
Good for you. What does that make you, seven? Well, then how do you get to 7.5? Because you know, the higher we go up in the scale, the harder it is to get to the next number, right? Because it's hard to get to a 10, right? It's, it's really difficult. So sometimes you just can't get from a seven to eight. Sometimes you just go to a seven to 7.5. So what are you going to do? What do you need to change in order to get yourself into that next mental level? All right, so we've got two numbers, physical number, mental number. Now, the third number, scale of 1 to 10, 1 miserable, 10 outstanding. Where are you at emotionally? And, you know, we talk about these things like emotional quotients or emotional intelligence, right? We talk about those those things and kind of feels it's a little, you know, what does that really mean? Well, basically, you know, how well are you able to control your emotions, first of all, right? I mean, do the little things get to you? I mean, do you find yourself responding, just reacting, and all of a sudden all this stuff comes out because you're in, uh, you have the inability to control your emotions? Well, that's for part of it. Or, or how well are you able to tap into the emotions of others? Because that's also important, right? Because how well are you able to understand another person's emotions? It's all part of that emotional intelligence, that emotional quotient. And, you know, you can always work on that. A lot of this is about intention. You know, how can you, what can you do to be more intentional about being better with your own emotions? So on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you at this week, right? Right, 1's bad, 10's outstanding, 5's in the middle. Where are you at this week? And then what can you do? You know, what can you do intentionally to change those things? You know, sometimes just listening can be a great exercise in dealing with your emotions. Instead of opening, you know, oh, you can hear him probably say, you can hear Dr. <laughs> Dr. Sparks probably say, you know what, we have two ears and one mouth. And, you know, there's a reason for that, right? So maybe that's part of your way of dealing with your emotions. And then finally... The fourth area is the spiritual area. And, you know, this area is the area that people always ask me, ah, oh, Jay, I don't know if that feel very spiritual. I don't know if I believe in the spiritual stuff. And, it, and I said, look, you know what? I, I have got a science background, okay? I mean, I, I, my, my master's of science and my PhD work was as an experimental psych guy. And, and listen, I get the whole science thing. But the truth is, you know what? I can't explain everything. Just can't. Sorry. Science can't explain everything. And I know that there's some of you out there say, well, eventually it will. And I'm going, no, it won't. <laughs> because there's so many things that we just can't explain. And sometimes that whole leftover thing that we can't explain, but we know is real. You know, sometimes you hear a piece of music and it touches your soul, right? We say that, right? And it's because it, it does something to us that we can't really explain, right? And we, and we can't scientifically explain it, but we know that it does. So the question is, you know, and, and for some people, it's faith in something, whether it's faith in God or faith in nature or, you know, faith in karma, or sometimes people have faith in themselves, right? But somewhere you have faith in something, I promise you that you do, and you believe that something gets you to the next place. So how is that working out for you spiritually, right? On a scale of one to 10, how is that going for you? Right? And then what do you, can you do about to change that? All right? So you've got these four numbers, right? You got a physical number, mental number, emotional number, and spiritual number, right? So you've got those numbers. Now what do you do with them, right? Well, you got to think of them as kind of like the legs of a, a of, of a chair, right? If they're uneven, it's kind of hard to sit in that chair, isn't it? And at the same time, if they're, if, if they're, if they're, if, if they're too low, it's really hard to sit in that chair, right? So the whole point is to bring that chair up as, as evenly as possible, but also to get it to the right, right height. And, you know, we have this book uh, today. It's called Actualized Leadership, and it is by none other than Dr. Uh, William Sparks, and he is outstanding. Dr. Sparks serves as uh, Dennis Thompson Chair and Professor of Leadership at McCall School and Business at Queens University, Charlotte. Concurrently, he serves as the managing director and uh, for William L. Sparks and Associates and as a partner with Peter Browning Partners, providing leadership team and board development services to organizations worldwide. He created and validated the Actualized Leader Profile, ALP. By the way, uh, if you go to www.alpfree.com, um, you can actually take the shortened profile and uh, it'll kind of, kind of, it's kind of cool. You'll, you'll enjoy that, right? And the ALP 360 and the Actualized Team Profile over the last 20 years, uh, he's validated it. He's uh, reliable. It's reliable. It's valid. And they've been translating, on, it's been translated in nine language. He's done TED Talks. He's uh, the power of self-awareness. He explores the importance of personal responsibility for self-actualization. He's completed his PhD in organizational behavior and development from the business school and public management at George Washington University. He lives currently in Charlotte, North Carolina, right here in the great state of North Carolina with his wife, Erin. And uh, so please welcome to the show and welcome Dr. William Sparks. 
Wow, thank you, Jay. It's a, it is a pleasure and an honor to be on your show tonight. I really appreciate the uh, very kind and generous introduction. Well, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for writing this book. Uh, you and I speak so much of the same language uh, when it comes to uh, when we, we talk about people and leadership, and uh, we, we, we may not use the same lingo. I think one of the things is that as psychological professionals, I think what happens is sometimes we get caught up in the jargon. And uh, I, I tell people, you don't know how much jargon there is in psychology. <laughs> There's a ton of jargon in psychology. But we're, <laughs> but, but we're on this show, what we're going to do is I'm going to go, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm a behaviorist. You may be a psychoanalytic guy. It's, it doesn't matter. Okay, this show, it doesn't matter. What we're after is how do we get to an actualized leadership? So let's talk about actualized leadership because I see people are chomping at the bit as they're all over the place uh, here uh, watching us live on Facebook, watching me live on Facebook and also on CastBox FM live. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And before we go any further, let me just say this. I need to give a shout out to the sponsors of today's show. Our sponsors are, of course, inline business brokers and advisors. They have been with us from the very beginning, and they have literally helped thousands of clients in the sale and purchase of businesses. So when it's time to sell your business, contact the professionals at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. You can learn more by going to inline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors, no matter where you're at in the world, they can help you find the right expert for your home. And if you happen to be in the Raleigh-Durham Research Triangle Park area, why don't you stop in and say hi and learn why they are the legends of customer service when it comes to real estate. And you can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's www. L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And the t-shirt shout out of the week. Well, that goes to Tony Fink, who happens to be one of Linda Craft's uh, real estate experts. And he is from Notre Dame. And he was so excited about Notre Dame winning on Monday that he sent me a Play Like a Champion t-shirt. And so I said I would wear it on the show. So here it is, Tony. Here's your t-shirt shout out. And so uh, congratulations to you and to, the, to Notre Dame for your win over uh, Louisville and the Cardinals. And we're with Dr. William Sparks in his book, Actualized Leadership. So, Dr. Sparks, uh, I love this book, first of all, but I, I want to say something about this book that I think that people are going to want to hear, and that is Actualized Leadership actually has a story, and you have this great little story because you got an F. <laughs> yes, I did. I got an, I got an F in life. <laughs> so, so, so tell the story about you and Dr. Harvey and uh, the F in life, because this kind of is the, this is kind of the jumping point. Uh, yeah, this was, week. this was the, where it started for me when I was uh, 27 years old and I was, um, had a lot of things going uh, right for me, but I was going through a divorce and, um, I turned in my very first paper uh, to Dr. Harvey, who uh, the late Dr. Harvey. He passed away in, in 2015. Some of your listeners may have seen or read The Abilene Paradox, which was his great claim to fame. And so he was very influential. In fact, his textbooks were his books were the textbooks we had in my master's program. And so I was really excited to be studying under Dr. Harvey. And I turned in my uh, we had to turn in one paper for the entire class. And I turned it in at the end of the semester talking about the um, transference and codependency that he explores in his uh, story of the Abilene Paradox. But I talked about it in my uh, failed marriage. And long story short, he called me into his office and he gave me uh, an A on the paper after making me wait um, for 24 hours uh, after he gave out the grades to the other class uh, class members, uh, students. And then, uh, but he said, I've got some bad news for you, and that is I'm going to give you an F in life because while you're correct, your your soon-to-be ex-wife is codependent. Uh, there's there's only one thing worse than that, and that's you. You created this dysfunction, and uh, you have the audacity to try to manipulate a clinical psychologist into feeling sorry for you. I don't. And uh, went on from there. So chapter one explores that in in great detail and with the kind of the dry wit of Dr. Harvey. But it, without telling me, he was introducing me to my shadow. And it um, I almost uh, quit the program. I, I thought long and hard about dropping out and moving back down to North Carolina and uh, – Thank goodness I didn't. I realized he was right, and uh, owning that and taking responsibility uh, was really a, a turning point. It was an indefinite inflection point in my life and has influenced me uh, every day since. And I, I felt like that moment was so critical in the first chapter to the entire rest of the book because I felt that what was happening here 
with you was that kind of gave you a jumping point, maybe unbeknownst to you at the time, but that gave you a jumping point to really start going, you know what, he actually gave you a gift that you could start giving back to others and actualize leadership, uh, by the way, which is available at Amazon, uh, as well as your favorite bookstore. And it is an Amazon number one bestseller, by the way. Uh, but it, he gave you a gift in reality. Absolutely. You see, you know, I, you could argue, or I can make an argument that it's probably the, the, one of the greatest gifts I've ever gotten, and it certainly changed my life. And the reason I included that um, as the very first chapter uh, in the book was because I'm, I'm asking the reader, uh, it's leadership is in the title, and certainly many of the uh, folks that are interviewed for the book are, are business leaders, although not all of them are. But um, whether you're you know, leading at the level of an entire organization or at the level of self or anything in between, I wanted to connect with the reader because I'm asking him or her to be vulnerable in the, in the process and to take responsibility. So I have a, a model of the transformational cycle for personal growth, and I think there are essentially three phases. Vulnerability, so you can be open to feedback, personal responsibility, taking uh, responsibility and being accountable for one's actions, and in my case, my actions, and then forgiveness, uh, and that includes uh, forgiving yourself and, um, and moving forward. And so I'm asking the reader to engage in that process, and I think it would be hypocritical if I, if I wrote it from a perspective of standing at the top of the mountain, looking down, offering guidance. And, and so I'm very much putting myself out there at the very beginning of the book uh, and, and, and trying to uh, – trying to mirror the, the vulnerability that I'm asking folks to engage in. So I'm trying to model that. Um, it's, it doesn't put me in a very good light, uh, but it was transformative for me. And I, so that's why I try to share that personal story. And every time I do, or I, get, I get a lot of feedback on that from folks I've never met uh, that have emailed or, or you know, sent me a message on Facebook. And, uh, and I, I, every time I do, I smile thinking it's a, a bit of a tribute uh, to Dr. Harvey as well. Oh, I think I think it absolutely is. Now, as part of this uh, story in the first page, and we're going to move first chapter. We're going to move on to the second chapter. But before we do that, this is where you introduce to us that there are three basic leadership styles, and and yes. and and this and these leadership styles come with a lot of positives, but these leadership styles also come with a lot of negatives. So. Why don't you, you know, helping a group of folks who are out there listening and watching, what are those three leadership styles? And let's kind of get a quick description of each before we sure. dig into that. Yeah, and not to jump ahead to Chapter 2, but the the reason that I think this is an important exercise is because I think today, and I see it in a lot of younger students, we are confusing self-awareness with knowing your strengths and playing to your strengths only. And I think that's one half of the self-awareness right. equation, but it's only one half. I agree. So to truly be self-aware, you have to own the light and the dark. And so I, I kind of I, I rail against the strength finders culture that we live in because uh, we're, we're missing that part of it. So the, well, the wait, 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 hold on, yeah. hold on. Let, well, let's stay there for a second because I think, this, see, this is the way the conversation goes. I'm just going to stop you. <laughs> right? This, that's, the, that's, the, that's the asserter in me, by the way. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't worry. I've, I've worked through my controlling, arrogant uh, <laughs> parts of me. I've, I've been working on those, the condescending issues. I've worked through those. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, so let's, let's talk about, though, because it is a myth. The, the myth of, you know, let's, let's just talk about it before we get into these, because I think it really is important. That we talk, to, we because there's this whole myth out there that we are really self-aware, and 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 the truth of the matter is we're not really all that self-aware, are we? Well, no, we're really not. I mean, I think most people lack true self-awareness. I think Maslow and Carl Jung would would put that number somewhere around five to ten percent that are truly self-aware, and so you've got ninety percent at best, if they're correct living in what Carl Jung called the fog of illusion. And so this this notion of self-awareness, it, it, it's more than just knowing your strengths. It's also understanding what you know what Jung called the shadow or the dark side and where we go into stress. And I'll tell you the, the way that it, the, we're, the world we're living in now is that you can use the word strength, but even using the word weakness will cause someone to bristle mm. because it has a negative connotation. And yet that's the whole point. It does have a negative connotation because it's describing something that is you know, less than optimal, if not outright dysfunctional. So even the language that we are using today and, and the kind of a reluctance, because what we end up calling it 
is an opportunity for development. It almost sounds like something that you would, you know, you would want to have. And so, but make no mistake, it, it, is, a, it is a weakness. It is the counter, it's the counterpoint to a strength. Um, Young had a very dualistic view of human nature. You know, for for the brighter your light, uh, the the darker the shadow, and and uh, he was very clear about that. And so, in order to appreciate, you know, and I just think if you, in order to appreciate happiness, you have to know sorrow, or right. you know, uh, love, you have to know despair, or whatever those counterpoints may be. And I think that you know, the more willing we are to be open to that. Uh, I think the better able we are to truly live in our potential. So it, it is it is a bit counterintuitive, and that, that's the point of the book, to loosely quote Jung, we don't become enlightened by pretending to be perfect and only acknowledging our strengths. We become we truly become enlightened when we have the courage to, to own our darkness and in doing that integrate it uh, so that we can step into our highest potential. Well, and then there's this, uh, and I'm going to throw out some psychological jargon, uh, here real quick because the the Dunning Kruger effect, Kruger effect, right? We overestimate our strengths and underestimate our weaknesses, right? Where, right. where right. we we have this tendency to believe that we are just you know far better than we really think we are, and we we don't really really know how weak our weaknesses are. And the question then becomes, this is the question that came out of the book for me. I was like, well, how 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 effective. I mean, you, you may be a pretty good leader, but how much better could you be if you were willing to look at the dark side of yourself? Yeah, and I think that it, and it's just it's not even just the leader. It's how much better of a person yeah, could right, you be sure. um, if you gave permission to those around you in your orbit, whether they're in your personal or professional life or both? You know, if you had the courage to say, hey, for example, I have a very high need for achievement, and that means I'm very detailed oriented. I'm uber organized. I, I have, uh, my wife is an off the chart achiever. So, you know, color coded spreadsheets for everything you can imagine. Um, and there are a lot of positives that go with that being very organized and efficient and, and detailed oriented, but the shadow of an achiever is a fear of failure. And so what the, what the achiever has to guard against under stress, uh, is becoming narrow minded, uh, rigid, they, they can be risk averse in a corporate setting. They're the classic micromanager. And here's the, you know, the irony in that is that if you micromanage or you you let your fear of failure drive your behavior, you, you're you're almost guaranteeing that you're going to either step into failure or you're going to you're going to be sub you're going to sub optimize your success. In other words, you're going to you're going to change uh, your trajectory. Uh, you're going to sort of downgrade it uh, if you're living in this fear based response. So owning that and being able to acknowledge that allows us to be honest and, and to and to have other you know the other part is we have to have people that are willing to call us out and keep us honest and say hey i think your fear failure shadow is kind of creeping up here you're, you're kind of going rigid or pessimistic and that just that confrontation allows us to snap out of it go wait you're right you're right i, I need to open not close i need to delegate not micromanage and so it's a very powerful and very simple process uh, if we're willing to do that. And I think a lot of times either our ego in a personal relationship or the in the corporate culture in a professional environment, um, you know, people are, are just not willing sometimes to to be vulnerable and to, and to be open in that way. And it's it's really tragic in my view because it it just you inherently limit your potential uh, if you're not willing to to be open to both sides. Well, I, 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 by the way, we're talking with Dr. William Sparks, author, uh, best-selling author of this book, Actualized Leadership, and uh, Meeting Your Shadow and Maximizing Your Potential. This is uh, not just a leadership book for organizations. This is about leading you, ultimately, and about becoming the best you that you could ever be. As a matter of fact, the subtitle is Meeting Your Shadow, Maximizing Your Potential, uh, and ultimately is, you know, what were you intended to be, and are you being that? And that's really one of the questions at the end of the book that Dr. Sparks um uh, talks about so while we're here now that we've gone through because it, 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 it started to make sense to me when we said you know what we do really need to talk about you know that we don't want to look at the dark side but let's talk about now the three styles now let's talk about the three styles yeah of leadership because now it's going to probably make more sense uh let's let's talk about those three things and let's talk about the, yeah. the, the good and let's talk about the good side and then the dark side the shadow yes yeah. So the the model. Um, I'll just quickly give a give a nod and a shout out, and I know you'll appreciate this as a psychologist. So the model is built on the shoulders of really four giants in psychology, 
And even though self-actualization is in the title, the primary theorist is Carl Jung, the famous Swiss uh, psychologist who uh, broke with Freud, uh, also had a psychodynamic perspective, but created analytical psychology as opposed to psychoanalytical Mm -hmm. in in his notion of the shadow, but also really of individuation, which is what he called self-actualization, is paramount to this work, as is, of course, Abraham Maslow, the father of humanistic psychology. Uh, Viktor Frankl, the famed author of Man's Search for Meaning, who survived the Holocaust, provides a critical uh, notion that I'll talk about in a moment, paradoxical intent. But um, the, the, the fourth is David McClellan, a deceased Harvard psychologist who was actually uh, was influenced by one of Freud's uh, protégés, I'm sorry, one of Jung's protégés, Henry Miller, and um, identified three motive needs that, that there are three different needs that really drive our behavior and usually there's one dominant in a person and i've talked about the need for achievement the achiever style which is detailed oriented uh, very efficient well organized color coded to do list or spreadsheets but the shadow of an achiever is a fear of failure and so when their shadow is triggered and things that trigger the shadow for an achiever are things like ambiguity the gray area not having a black and white answer um, having to think more long term, the prospect of losing, obviously, those are things that trigger the fear of failure shadow. And so those positive aspects then go dark. So they become rigid, pessimistic, um, uh, uh, kind of narrow minded, um, and they shut down when they need to open up. And so in a corporate setting, that, that's the classic micromanager. So that's the first style. The second uh, motive need is a need for affiliation. And I call this leadership style the affirmer. And affirmers are driven out of a need for relationships. So the first style, the achiever, is driven out of a need for recognition. The affirmer is driven out of a need for relationships. And these are the warm, friendly individuals um, that kind of make life and work worth showing up for. So Ellen DeGeneres has been profiled as an affirmer. Charlie Brown is the classic affirmer. Uh, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, uh, these are famous affirmers that are very relationship-driven. And so they're loyal, they're friendly, they're empathetic. Uh, they're always there to support. Uh, they're there to, to care for others. They are the true servant leaders uh, in our organizations, often putting the needs of others before their own. But their shadow, their leadership shadow, is a fear of rejection, a fear of separation, which is a primal fear that we all have on some degree. But for the affirmer, it is, it's more front and center. So a fear of, a fear of uh, rejection shadow leads to things like being conflict avoidant, um, sugarcoating the truth, being overly accommodating, um, self-censoring what they really think or feel, saying yes when they want to say no. These are all classic things that the uh, firmer uh, often engage in and allow sometimes allow others to take advantage of them or to um, kind of take advantage of their loyalty. And the third style is the need for power, uh, the need for control, and, and I call this style the asserter. And this this style it has some similarities to the achiever, but it's more of the uh, results driven. So it's not about personal recognition, but it is about longer term, larger results. And so these individuals like to be in control. They are decisive. They are confident. They're often charismatic. Um, they 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 they're very candid with others. Um, they tend to be more strategic. They're comfortable dealing with ambiguity. An asserter may ask for forgiveness, but they're likely not to ask for permission. And um, so there are a lot of classic kind of leadership traits that you see in the asserter. But the shadow of an asserter is a fear of betrayal. Uh, Assertors have a very hard time being vulnerable. They're kind of like the Fonzie, you know, which I actually saw Henry Winkler in an airport a few months ago. In happy days, if your listeners will remember that, he couldn't quite say I was wrong. He right. could, I was wrong. Right. He would almost get it out, but he couldn't quite say it. And that's the classic asserter. So they have a hard time admitting when they're wrong. They have a hard time asking for help. Um, they have a hard time saying I'm sorry. So being vulnerable, they, they can take themselves a bit too seriously. And so they under stress – um, when they feel like they're wrong or they're going to have to ask for help or they feel vulnerable, their, their shadow is a fear of betrayal, and it kicks in, and so they can become arrogant, condescending, impatient, domineering. Uh, they see an argument as a chess match. Instead of seeing 
a difference of opinion or perspective as an opportunity to grow or to learn or to just understand a different perspective. They see it as a chess match that's meant to be won and often won at all cost. And that was I was a shadow asserter going back to chapter one. And so I was I was always very confident in my decision. I was you know I, I was always right. Um, I like to make sure that everyone knew that, and so there was some uh, immaturity and arrogance that went along with that. And uh, it was it was that conversation with Dr. Harvey when I got the F in life, and I, I began to realize the ultimate price that that many of us pay for that. So those are just a quick snapshot of the three styles, the motive needs under each of those, and then the sh- corresponding shadows with each. We're talking with Dr. William L. Sparks. Uh, the book is called Actualized Leadership, number one best-selling book, Amazon, by the way. Uh, Meeting Your Shadow and Maximizing Your Potential. And uh, he just walked us through the three leadership styles. By the way, you can look up your little sample leadership style by going to www.alp, free, that's A-L-P, which stands for Actualized Leadership Profile, A-L-P, free, F-R-E-E, dot com. And uh, you can take it. And then if you want further, you can you can you actually purchase to take the, the bigger test that has so much more to it available as well. It's less than $100, and it, it's a complete test, and it's absolutely outstanding as well. But you can take the free little test. I happen to be an asserter, and it's interesting because uh, as an asserter, I don't – I don't have all the streets, and maybe it's perhaps because I've done so much self-work of looking at my own, what I call my big black garbage bag of crud uh, <laughs> that I carry over my shoulder, and every now and then somebody pokes a hole in the back of that garbage bag, and it really stinks, and I have to go look at it and go, with it I miss? Um, is, is kind of how I say it in my own little way, but it's really true because I know that there are times when my pride gets in the way, and rather than being vulnerable, I just choose to disclose right? Um, which is just not really vulnerability. I just disclose what I, just enough without feeling vulnerable. I, 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 and I think I've worked through some of the stuff of being really quick to ask for forgiveness. Uh, much, I think when I was younger, I would never ask for forgiveness and take responsibility for it. I still struggle. If I have to be honest, my still, my big struggle is dang it. I have to be right. And and I still struggle with that. My wife reminds me. We joke about it now because I said I got to work on this. And I said, Will you Will you please, you know, call me on it when I go? Am I trying to be right here? You know. <laughs> and she, I, yeah. she, yeah. So I make her call me on it because sometimes you have to just be right. I mean, some of this is that you have to be called on your stuff and be willing to take it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got to be. That's exactly right. You, if you're gonna take this journey you've got to be and, and the, it's easy intellectually to, to say it now but under when you're triggered under stress uh you know sometimes I, I, re, I regret that but you know more often than not i realize you know hey i need to take a step back or i need to take a breath or or uh, take a walk around the block or something like that or save the email as a draft that's another big one too a lot of times we feels great to hit send on the message and then we Maybe wake up in the middle of the night and go, you know, that might not have been the best uh, best thing to do. So. Yeah, I, I, we joke. It's now become a joke we, we, because I've said you've got to – you have. I said, you know what? I am so sick and tired of having to be right. I said, it's driving me crazy. And I said, you've got to call me on it. And so now we have this joke. I mean, now it's a running joke, right, whenever she feels it coming on. And I actually now can laugh at myself about it and go, okay, you're right. You know what? I, I'm st- – st- stupid me is feeling like I got to be right. And then, and then of course the other part for me, there's a, there's this part of me that is like, I hate to lose, right? I hate, yep. hate to lose. Matter of fact, it took me two days to congratulate the guy who beat me in the championship game of the fantasy football last year. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, that's how, that's how, that's how horrible that it, this disease can be. And, <laughs> and it, it really is such a disease at times. And I don't think people really recognize that, you know, you have to take a look at that on another level because I had to really look at that and go, why, why is that so important? You know, I know I'm competitive, but why is that it's so important to me that, you know, that, yeah. and, and right. I mean, cause that's, that's the hard thing because I, I really challenged myself. I, I remember sitting, sitting in, in Carolina beach going, why was that? So, why is it so important to you? Why do you? This is, you, nobody's really making any money on this. Why are you so upset about this? You know, losing, right? 
Yeah, I mean that's a great example of just you know how every day you you can and I as an assertor I can certainly you know relate to that very well. I think that one of the things I've learned over the years is that um, you know I get to choose what tug of war I get into as my Sicilian mentor, Dr. Dominic J. Mineta, who I uh, dedicated the book to. Dr. Mineta reminds me often that. Uh, we can we can pick up the rope and we can get into a tug of war or we can just step over it. And I think the more self-actualized we become, the more resilient and settled we become. And so I may completely disagree with a person um, and and have a very different perspective or opinion and just not feel the need to engage uh, in in trying to be right or even you know win an argument. And I think that's where. Um, that's that's been very helpful for me because I, I was always one to pick up the rope and start tugging. And so um, I, I, there's a I can't think of the quote exactly now, but it, it reminds me of the you know kind of insecurity screams confidence is quiet. You know, yeah. and so I, I think about that a lot of times. I think about if I feel myself getting ready to engage or or getting ready to um, try to be right. You know, is it my own security insecurity coming out or you know, can I be quiet with this and, and have a, a deeper sense of of satisfaction maybe or, or just assurance uh, in that? And so when I talk about the anecdotes for the shadows, one of the, the anecdote for the fear of betrayal for the assertor is assurance, kind of the sense of, you know, we, we don't live in an unsafe, hostile environment for the most part. You know, we live in a fairly safe environment, and so we can let our guard down and um, and allows us to connect in an entirely different way. But assertors, and I'm one, you know, that that's a that's a tall order. It sure is. We're talking with Dr. William Sparks, his book, Actualized Leadership, and you're listening to right here on A New Direction. And A New Direction is brought to you by, who else, but our longtime, first-time ever sponsor, and that was Inline Business Brokers and Advisor. So are you a business owner? At some point, you're going to need the services of an experienced business broker. Selling your business is a big deal. It's a huge deal. So make sure you build your deal team with the internationally known experts at Inline Business Brokers and Advisors. Seriously, they are internationally known. And you know what? You can learn more by going to nline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And check out their Facebook page. You can also check them out as well. And then also, Linda Craft and Team Realtors. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. If you are looking to sell your home or buy your home, Linda Craft and her team can help match you up with the right real estate expert to help you sell that home or find that home. And if you happen to be the Raleigh-Durham Research Triangle Park area, stop in on Six Forks Road. Check them out. They'll give you free bottle water. I promise you they will. Tell them that Jay told you to give free bottle, but they'll do it anyway. Matter of fact, people say, please stop giving me us water. But check them out because here's <laughs> the deal. Here's the deal. They, they are known to be the legends of customer service when it comes to real estate. They've been doing it for over 34 years. So why not find out why that is? Just go to lindacraft.com. It's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we're back with uh, on A New Direction with Dr. William Sparks and his book, Actualized Leadership. So we're going through this book a little bit here, and I, 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 we haven't we haven't talked much about Frankel, but Frankel says something. You, you quote him. Well, actually, you don't quote him. You say Frankel in his Man's Search for Meaning, he focused on the only real power he had as the victim of the abuse that he experienced during World War II, and that is the freedom to choose his response to the situation. And then you go on to say we are we are free to choose our attitude and response to every situation or person. When we react to others in fear and anger, we relinquish this freedom of choice. And I feel, I, it really spoke to me because I'm, I'm a big believer that we just have choices. And I remember teaching psychology classes and saying, look, you can kick me in the shin. I have a number of responses. I do not at six feet, five inches, 250 pounds have to you know, punch <laughs> you back, right? So I, I don't have to do that. But I have a choice. And, and I am not an accumulation of all the things that have happened to me in the past. I still have a choice for all those things. Dig deeper into that. Yeah, so uh, that, that's another example of that is that, you know, when we get cut off in traffic, the car in front of us that just cut us off, their, their bumper is not somehow magically – there's not a string tied to our middle finger that causes it to go up automatically. So, you know, when you cut off in traffic, we some people yell and scream and beat the horn or, you know, or more. And, um, well, they cut me off. But actually, you know, we have a choice. We, we, can, we can think, well, maybe they have something really important going on or maybe they're just a jerk. Uh, but, you know, we can choose our response to that. When we react, 
we forfeit that freedom. And, and Frankel was very clear to tell us that's the only freedom that we have. So, And that's where it, it, he and Carl Jung lived at the same time. There's no real evidence that they corresponded, but you certainly see the influence they had on each other. And Jung uh, famously said, I am not what has happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And um, he was talking about individuation, which is what influenced Maslow to create the concept of self-actualization. And so, you know, Jung's kind of laying the groundwork. And in fact, Maslow cited Jung as kind of the forerunner in the humanistic approach of instead of looking at what's wrong, let's, looking, let's look at what's right with individuals and kind of how those that live into their highest potential. And so... Um, I think that 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 quote about you know we can be a victim or we can we can choose to to own our take responsibility and live into our highest potential. Um, there's a famous book called Escape from Freedom by Eric Fromm, who was also uh, a psychoanalyst, forty and trained, one of uh, and one of the uh, psychiatrists in the Vienna Circle, and uh, his his book Escape from Freedom essentially says that many of us would rather be the victim and forego freedom than to reclaim total freedom for our lives. But with that comes total responsibility as well. And I've always thought that was a very powerful notion. Um, and sadly, I think he's probably more right today than he was, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago when, when he first published the book. So there's a lot of power in that. Now, the other thing that Frankel, uh, that I cite Frankel for that's critical for self-actualization is this notion of paradoxical intent. Paradoxical intent is when the very thing we are trying to avoid, we create. And so the whole point in helping people identify their shadow is to help them realize that if they are allowing their fear of failure or fear of rejection or fear of betrayal shadow to drive their behavior, Frankl famously said the more we fear something, the more likely we are to experience it. And that, to me, that's probably the most powerful insight in the book. I mean, the, if, you, if you really start thinking about what do I fear the most, and if, if I'm letting that fear drive my behavior, I'm actually increasing the likelihood that I'm going to experience the very thing I'm trying to avoid. And so Carl Jung is often credited with saying this. There's some debate about whether he said it or not, but he's credited with saying it a slightly different way we meet our destiny on the road we took to avoid it. And by destiny, he means the very thing we were trying to avoid, whether it's failure or rejection or betrayal or whatever else it may be. When we let fear drive our behavior and we're in our shadow, we increase the probability that we're going to experience that very thing, the very thing that we're trying to avoid. So it's a very powerful concept. It requires vulnerability, but it also requires the responsibility uh, that comes with, you know, having a life that is well lived, but one that you take total responsibility for, and and that means, you know, I can't blame the person for cutting me off in traffic if I overreact, uh, you know, like a adolescent or you know, crazed teenager. I have to <laughs> own that, uh, irrespective of what the context is. So, talk to us. How does Maslow and McClellan fill it into this? But Maslow, uh, certainly his work in self-actualization, understanding that, first of all, I think that it's a, it's a higher order need. So these other needs, achievement, affiliation, and power, are all deficiency needs. We're trying to meet something that we feel like we're deficient in. Uh, they're trying to answer what I call these eternal questions. If you're an achiever, you're trying to satisfy the question of, am I worthy? If you're an affirmer, you're trying to satisfy the eternal question of, am I wanted? And if you're an asserter, you're trying to satisfy the question, am I safe? But in all of those cases, there are deficiency needs, whereas the self-actualization need is a growth need. And so that is where we step out of our ego um, and we begin to live at a, at a different level. Uh, we, we just transcend some of the things that maybe used to trigger us, and we're more creative. We, we would rather talk about ideas than people, you know, to kind of get out of the whole criticizing and critiquing others and focus more on ideas that tend to be more creative. We allow that creative side to kick in. Um, and in the full version of the Actualized Leader Profile, I assess the nine, what I call the nine attributes of actualized leaders, and I spent the last 12 or 13 years researching the characteristics of self-actualized individuals. 
and there were nine that I found that had a statistically significant correlation with self-actualization. And so all of those nine come from uh, from Abraham uh, Maslow's research. Uh, there were 17 he identified in total, and, and so eight of those, while I think humility and gratitude, for example, those two certainly are a part of being self-actualized, uh, they're not part of the full assessment because they didn't make the, the nine cut. But something like peak performance or flow, as we were talking before we went on air with Chick Sent Me High from the University of Chicago, uh, who certainly added to that concept, Maslow called that a peak experience. And uh, it really, in, in many ways, they were talking about the same thing, although I think um, Chick Sent Me High really did a better job of operationalizing it uh, from a perspective. So Maslow is critical for adding that aspect of the not only understanding it as a higher order need, but certainly the nine attributes and the full ALP assessment all come directly from Maslow. I got you. So I, I'm going to move ahead here because I just I'm like going. Do you know where? Do you know how fast this this has gone? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> it has gone by fast. Yeah. I'm like I'm like oh my gosh we're we're down to the last like you know ten minutes or so. I'm like. We haven't even we even got out of you know part one. <laughs> we haven't got part one because it's been this has been a lot yeah. of, it, it's been a lot of fun and I've really enjoyed this. <laughs> so let's let me just jump ahead a little bit here and okay, sure. let's let's talk about how our leadership style affects the greater organization. Yeah, so that's going to be – that's actually going to be the next book. It's going to be Actualized Teamwork, Managing the Shadow Side of Culture. I'm about two-thirds of the way through writing that now, but that was that goes all the way back to my dissertation research. And essentially, achievers create what I call a detached culture because if they're shadow achievers and they micromanage um, – it actually creates the lowest performing culture in a work environment um, where there's anger and apathy. And that that is the tragic irony that Viktor Frankl was trying to tell us about, that actually the achiever style, if they're a shadow achiever, um, they're going to create the lowest performing culture and thereby almost guarantee they're going to experience the failure they're trying to avoid. So the very thing they're trying to do to micromanage uh, a project or a process or a person to their to their definition of perfection, and I think that's key. It's to their definition, not some absolute definition. Right. Uh, will ultimately create the lowest performing culture. So that's a detached culture. The affirmer style needs to be careful. A shadow affirmer that's avoiding conflict and avoiding difficult conversations and being overly accommodating and maybe spending too much time on relationships and not enough time on performance creates what I call a dramatic culture, and that is a warm and friendly culture on the surface, but beneath the surface, there's a high level of frustration uh, because of the, we're, people aren't being uh, held to a certain standard, poor performers are, are maybe being um, tolerated and accepted, and that drives down morale for the others, so that's one to be uh, on guard against, and that is the classic trip to Abilene, if any of your listeners know the, the Abilene paradox. That's when the, the group is unable to manage agreement. Uh, that, that causes their dysfunction. And then the final culture is uh, dependent. And so the asserter style that likes to be in charge and in control, if they're a shadow asserter, they create codependency at home and at work. And uh, that's a culture that's kind of frozen in fear and anxiety. No one wants to upset the boss, uh, keep your head down, play it safe. And so, you know, it's like a car that's in third gear. You'll get from point A to point B, but you're not going to get the innovation and the creativity and the full hearts and minds of folks because they're afraid to make a mistake or upset the boss. And so you've got different dysfunctions in all three. And so the goal is to is to not be less of an achiever or less of an affirmer or less of an asserter. At, that, at this point, that's kind of who we are, but it's to actualize yourself so that you are an actualized whatever, achiever, affirmer, or asserter. And so you're, you're more in the light – and you you avoid so uh, for example an actualized a farmer um, is someone who is friendly and warm and you know they care about you but they're also direct they're candid they they call out poor performance they're not going to tolerate someone who's not doing their fair share um, and you know they will if there's an elephant in the room they'll call it out and have a group discussion and so. One of the stories that we hear about in Charlotte back when uh, Mr. Hugh McCall was um, running Nations Bank and then Bank of America 
there were stories of when someone would come in his office and say, Hugh, I'm having an issue with so-and-so. And he would say, okay, sit right there. I'll be right back. And he would go and get so-and-so and bring them into his office and say, sit right there across from this person. Okay, continue with what you were telling me, but tell this person, <laughs> don't tell me. So, you know, that kind of like, just call it out, very transparent culture. So keep the warm and the friendly part, because that's who you are at your core, but but have the courage to of your convictions and, and uh, not let that shadow kick in. So it's, it's not trying to change who you are, but it's trying to actualize uh, the best of each of those three styles. We're with uh, Dr. William Sparks here on A New Direction, and the book's called Actualized Leadership. And A New Direction and Dr. Sparks is brought to you by none other than inline business brokers and advisors. Uh, they uh, represent profitable, profitable privately held companies with gross annual revenues in excess of $1 million. Inline delivers the highest market value in the shortest amount of time with complete confidentiality. That is the registered trademark. And so you can learn more uh, about the internationally known inline business brokers and advisors by going to inline.com. That's E-N-L-I-G-N.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors. No matter where you're at in the world, they can help you sell or buy your home by finding the right professional to help you get whatever you need done in the real estate world. And if you happen to be in the Raleigh-Durham, Chapel Hill area, in the otherwise known as the Research Triangle Park, RTP, stop in and see them and find out why. For 34 years, they are known as the legends of customer service when it comes to real estate. And you can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's www.lindacraft.com. And we thank them for sponsoring A New Direction. And we're back here on A New Direction with uh, author, uh, author, psychologist, uh, dude's amazing. His name is Dr. William Sparks. The book's called Actualized Leadership, Meeting Your Shadow and Maximizing Your Potential. And you know what? We're getting so low on time, but I'm just going to keep going. We're just going to grind this thing out because I just got to, because the book's so doggone good. And one of the things as we, as you moved on through this, you, you know, you actually take us through layers, if you will. Of transfer of this transformational journey, and you literally, you know, you literally take us through one layer after another layer, and we start peeling back the layers. I, I, I almost thought it was kind of like an onion as we were doing this transformation, and then we get to the part where we go, okay, now what do we do? How do we practically make that change? And what are some of the practical tips? So I thought maybe what you could do is maybe kind of, I'm not telling you to give away the whole thing, but maybe. You know, let's talk about a few practical things that if you happen to be an achiever or an affirmer or an asserter, what are some practical things that we can do to start beginning this this journey of peeling back these onions and it's onion layers and working through uh, our dark side? Yeah, so there's a there's a fair amount in the book that goes into that uh, in, in great detail, and there's some other uh, support materials, worksheets, and and a, and a workbook and development guide that are available if someone's interested in really getting serious with this journey. Um, I think that the first thing you have to do is kind of self-assess and know where where you are. So, for example, when I when I talk about being conflict avoidant, that only applies to the affirmer. So, for the assertors listening to this uh, program, they're going to go well. You know that I'm not conflict avoidant. That doesn't affect me, and they're they're right. It doesn't. And so I think you have to self-assess and know what your shadow is. However, if you are an asserter, being vulnerable, saying you're sorry, asking for help, not being able to help someone who needs it, those are triggers for that fear of betrayal shadow. So I think you have to start by self-assessing and having an accurate assessment of the shadow you're dealing with. And then for each of them. I talk about the, what I call the anecdote. So there's a transformational cycle that involves vulnerability, personal responsibility, and forgiveness that is kind of the overall model for that. But there, but then unique to each of the three shadows, there's a specific uh, what I call anecdote to develop. And for the, uh, for the achiever, it's developing uh, a sense of abundance. Achievers really, without realizing it, they're going through life with a very scarce a scarce. Uh, mentality, kind of the scarcity set where it's zero sum. If you win, I lose. There's not enough to go around for everyone. And so if they develop an abundance mentality, it quiets the fear of failure shadow. All of a sudden, it is 
wait a minute, there's enough to go around for everyone. I can celebrate someone else winning. That doesn't mean I lose just because they win. And so developing a sense of abundance and gratitude for what you have and where you are, wherever you may be, um, is really a powerful thing. And so I, this has just happened to me this afternoon. I mentioned to you I'm moving, and I had – and one of my MBA students happened to be driving by my old house as I'm moving stuff out there to the curb to give a few things away. He's riding a bike, and he is an international student from Germany and uh, was so excited. To, and I was like, this is – no, you can have it. He's I just have an apartment. You know, I only have a bed. I don't have any furniture. And I said, no, you can have all of this. This is great. And, of course, he's on a bike. So I loaded it up in my car, and I – I took it over to his apartment, and he, and, you know, it's, it's just the sense of gratitude, and people that are grateful. It doesn't matter what they have or how much they have in their bank account; they're happy. People that are, that just don't have a sense of gratitude. It doesn't matter how much money they have. It doesn't matter what they're just never happy and they're never never satisfied. And that's that's something about themselves that they need to explore and address, because there's no amount of material uh, wealth. That's going to fix that problem. And so here was, you know, someone who was taking a, a, a lamp that I didn't want and a dresser and some other things and was acting like it was Christmas morning. So gratitude and abundance are critical for the achiever. For the affirmer, it's developing a sense of connection to their purpose. So connection is a little bit misleading. It's not connection to something outside of yourself. It's connection to your purpose inside. And when an affirmer connects to their purpose in life, um, then they become more able to deal with conflict, to have difficult conversations, and, and just to be more confident in their own direction. So they rely less on the affirmation of others. And when you do that, you really regain your power. And then for the asserter, it's cultivating a sense of assurance, uh, a sense of safety, a sense of forgiveness, both for yourself and for you know for others that may have wronged you in any way. And developing that sense of assurance and safety, psychological safety allows uh, assertors to engage with others on a more vulnerable level. Of course, the, the, the most watched TED Talk, I think now it's up to 46 million, Brene Brown's classic, The Power of Vulnerability. If, no, if your listeners haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. It's eight or nine years old now, but it, it is really kind of calls to question the, the need to be vulnerable uh, and why the, the benefits we gain from that. And so I think there's a powerful call to action for the assertors there. So cultivating those three. The, the one thing I would say, though, Jay, and I think this is as a disclaimer, though, and this applies to all three styles and all three shadows, if you take this journey, you may have those in your life right now that like you where you are, your orbit, whatever that fear orbit is of failure or rejection. An employer may love that you have a fear of failure because they know that you'll stay all night and micromanage the project or do it yourself, and they're taking advantage. An affirmer, there, you have someone in your orbit who knows you're going to be overly accommodating, um, and, and they're going to take advantage of that. And, and for the assertive, you know, you have others in your orbit that are going to play to your ego and tell you that you're right when on some level you probably know you're wrong. Um, so when we take the work to do this, to, to actualize our potential and to do the shadow work, there are going to be those in our life often that don't like that. And so we have to have the courage of our convictions to stay true to this path and make the change, knowing that you know there are those that we may lose along the way who don't have our highest purpose or our highest potential in mind. They like us where we are, and when we choose to live into our highest potential and step into our highest potential, and I know this from personal experience, we may lose some along the way, but we ultimately realize that you know they, they liked us where we were, not where we could be. Mm. His name is Dr. William Sparks. The book is called Actualized Leadership. If you did not grow today, you just didn't listen. So you need to just download the podcast. <laughs> that's just the <laughs> truth. Because that's the truth. Because he, you know, I, I always ask, you know, like my guests, which I call my friends, because you and I are going to be friends, because I promise you we're going to get together at some point. Uh, so I look forward to it. You know, it's because we're only a few miles apart, really, in reality, <laughs> a couple hours apart. Uh, you know, normally I ask my guests, I, I say to them, I said, if you could leave people with a new direction, you know, based on actualized leadership, what would that be? But I think you just did that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think for, for this, well, this would actually be the last thing I would say, and this is maybe a little bit, it's sort of the same thing, but it's a little more direct. If you don't manage your shadow, 
it will manage you. Mm. That's it. I mean, there, there's no other there's no other option. There's there's not a multiple choice. To, I mean, you either have the choice to manage to to meet and process your shadow, integrate it, and begin to walk with it, or it will manage you. And when it manages you, it's going to manage you to a negative outcome that's either less than optimal of what it could be or outright dysfunctional. So we all have that choice. We can any any time we can choose to go, you know what, I'm ready to meet it, I'm ready to own it and integrate it. And in that we reclaim, I think, our ultimate power and step into our brightest light and potential. If we don't, it's gonna manage us. We see patterns of dysfunction in our life. We want to blame others or the stars aren't aligned or fate's against me and Young said it, there's no such thing as fate. It's simply our shadow uh, that has gone unmanaged, unnoticed, unprocessed, and being projected on the others. So, you know, pretty heady kind of stuff to think about, but at the end of the day, either we manage it or it manages us. Wow. His name's Dr. William Sparks. His book is entitled Actualized Leadership by the Book. Get the book. Seriously, get the book. Actualized Leadership, available Kindle paperback i'm holding it right up here meeting your shadow and maximizing your potential this book is a not a game changer it's a life changer okay and that's what this book is and you need to get it amazon go to your local bookstore find it if they don't have it on the shelves tell them you got to get it it's that good and i'm having to put it on the bookshelves folks that's the show you've listened to a new direction and you know i got to tell you something i am so um blessed and grateful to have I, I, I get amazing guests and out of nowhere sometimes they just they just come and I'm so blown away when I have a guest like Dr. Sparks and they come into come into the, my, my home and sit at my table and allow me to do this and I'm so grateful for him and I'm so grateful for all of you who listen and support the show and I want to just thank you all over this great world uh, that from Israel who downloads the show to India to Senegal and Portugal. Thank you all for downloading the show. And in this great country of ours, I thank you as well. So as I say every week, you know what, folks? Be inspired. Because when you're inspired, that means you can inspire someone else. And when you do that, they in turn can inspire others. And that can make this world a great place. So I look forward to seeing you next week with another great guest. And as I say every week, you know what that is. Ciao, everybody. To go a different way, yeah. The time has come for a new direction. your confidence and the answers don't make sense you got to keep your hope alive you got to know you can survive this is your time to find a new direction a brand new day a new direction things are gonna change Your dreams will take you place.